important announcement for our viewers to today's webcast. During this webcast, we encourage you to please send your email questions for the Q&A period to sierrarm at calepa.ca.gov, S-I-E-R-R-A-R-M at calepa.ca.gov. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Julia Friedman to this afternoon's seminar. Dr. Friedman is head of the Carbon Management Program for Lawrence Livermore National Lab. He leads initiatives and research into carbon capture, carbon storage, and fossil fuel recovery and utilization. In, in this role, he has submitted congressional testimony for the U.S. Senate and California Assembly. His research interests include carbon sequestration, underground coal gasification, hydrocar hydrocarbon systems, deep water depositional systems, basin and range tectonics and sedimentation, sequence stratigraphy, and landslide physics. Quite a lot. <laughs> Dr. Friedman has published in Foreign Affairs and the New York Times and worked with US EPA, USGS, and DOE, and many private companies. In 2005, Dr. Friedman was invited by MIT to join their team on the future of coal energy. And in 2006, helped assemble the National Petroleum Council report on the future of oil and gas in the US. Won't you please welcome to today's seminar, Dr. Julia Friedman. Uh, let me start by thanking Elizabeth for that fantastic introduction and thanking ARB for having me here. Uh, I'm really most appreciative, and this is a topic that I love to talk about um, and one that I'm eager to talk about to folks here today. So I uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, uh, what I uh, plan to present is a discussion about reducing emissions in California uh, through what's basically an emerging old technology. Some people call it a new technology. In some ways it is, but it's also an emerging old technology, carbon capture and sequestration. And uh, because of California is California, there's things about the application of carbon capture and sequestration in the state and the potential for emissions reduction using this technology that really are specific to the state. And it's not just the geology, which is important, but also the mix of sources, the mix of resources that all come together in the same place that I think are of interest and, and provide a real opportunity. Uh, for uh, those people on the web and those people here, I usually like to start with conclusions because people leave and off you go. So uh, uh, the first thing, if, if, if you don't take anything home from this message but this first bullet point, this is the winner. Everything we know about carbon capture and sequestration today suggests that it's going to be a successful technology that can dramatically reduce emissions reductions. Okay, Everything we know from the basic geoscience to the plant engineering, to the economics. The current knowledge strongly supports this as a successful technology. It's not to say we know everything. The corollary to that is there are some technology gaps. Those appeal to be resolvable, even resolvable at large scale deployment. The second thing is what are the key issues in safe and successful deployment? I'd argue that there's site characterization, monitoring, and hazard assessment. And if you can do those things well, then you can have a good project. Site characterization is actually the most important of these things, and all information derives from that. The punchline being, if you choose a good site, then you're 90% there. Um, the last point is, uh, I really wanted to stress that with this audience, and I'd like to have this opportunity to talk about it, because California shows such leadership in so many dimensions on these topics that it's, uh, it's really uh, interesting and, I think, valuable to think about deployment of sequestration in the state. And the specific mix of carbon sources that you have, the specific needs of the geology, provide real near-term opportunities to dramatically reduce emissions from sequestration. So first, I want to start with a point of urgency. Most people understand that there is a climate crisis. I think the people in this room are pretty comfortable with that on the whole. Um, most people don't realize just how grave it is and just how bad it is. So what are here are the conventional scenarios that are run by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Um, the worst scenario, if you will, the highest emission scenario is the A1B scenario, uh, which is the upper red line. Um, that's the one which is rapid economic growth, low ecological focus, and large population growth. Uh, the point of this presentation here, the slide, is that we're actually way above the worst case scenario today. Not a little bit, we're way above, and we're actually projected to go way above next year and the next that we're already at 32 billion tons of carbon dioxide a year. With a billion tons, as a rounding kind of number, a billion tons is roughly the mass of all human beings on the planet. So we put 31 times that in the atmosphere every year. So this is not a small task. This is a big task. The other sense of urgency comes from 
uh, the recent uh, uh, issues with the ocean ice in the Arctic. And again, this got headlines all over September. People were surprised. Most people didn't quite understand why it was such a big deal, and this is it. Uh, the A1B scenario, again, the high emission scenario, people have run ensembles of climate models, 30 different climate models, many different runs per climate model to come up with this trajectory for what's going to happen with the sea ice. In 2007, we hit the worst case scenario mean 20 years before we were supposed to. This suggests also that there are strong feedbacks in the system which are bringing us more urgent climate change results than we anticipated pretty dramatically. So as a consequence, the urgency associated with emissions reduction is one of the things that makes carbon capture and sequestration such a central and important technology to all of this. Um, the, to a first order, what you're talking about doing here is actually very stupid. And by stupid, I mean it's a, it's a hard to break technology. It's, it doesn't have a lot of moving parts. It's not sophisticated. There's not much finesse. What you do is you concentrate the CO2 from surface power uh, supplies or uh, in the flue streams, and then you stuff it underground way down deep. And if you can do those things successfully, then you've done carbon capture and sequestration. The vertical scale bar in this figure is about two kilometers. Some people think that we're putting this, you know, we're digging trenches in people's backyards and sort of stuffing CO2 into them. No, you've got a kilometer of the Earth's crust over on top of any place you're going to do this. And what you're really talking about is storing them in two fundamental places, either saline formations. These are basically geological formations that are full of brine. And by brine, we mean, you know, in many cases, much saltier than seawater. This has a terrific capacity. By capacity, in this case, uh, the conservative estimates uh, for, the, for the globe are 22,000 gigatons. Think about the 32 gigatons we're venting as a year. So roughly speaking, 100 times more than we need on an annual basis. That estimate's probably a dramatic underestimate. We probably have way more than that. And the United States is blessed with a terrific resource, so is California, in terms of sequestration capacity. In terms of depleted oil and gas fields, that's actually places where we've actually proven that the crust could hold buoyant fluids for a long time. And it's also places where there's a potential economic upside in the form of enhanced oil recovery or enhanced natural gas recovery. Um, the physics and chemistry of these two places, these two kinds of formations are pretty similar. And we know quite a lot about them from analog industry. But this is basically what we're talking about. Um, in order to sort of get off the ground, in order to pass the laugh test, it's worth asking yourself, can I get a terawatt of power from this? Can I get four gigatons of abatement from this? And I say four gigatons because this graph is in gigatons of carbon, which crudely is four gigatons of CO2. And if you can't get that, if you can't get one-eighth of global emissions eventually, then this isn't a very important technology. This analysis was done by Steve Pakla and Rob uh, Sokolow at Princeton. Uh, and basically, it's just a very quick and dirty way of thinking about what's important and what's not. And they said that if you can't get one of these, what they call abatement wedges, then it's not an important technology. Um, the first thing I want to communicate to you is that sequestration is not a panacea. You cannot get seven wedges from this. Similarly, you can't get seven wedges from any technologies that we have available. You're going to mix and match. match. So what can we reasonably expect? We can reasonably expect to get one wedge of abatement through carbon sequestration. That's essentially equal to about the volume of oil or the volume of natural gas we move around the world today. So it's not a small volume, but we move those masses, and we can produce that from the subsurface, so we can inject it in the subsurface. It passes the last test. The most that we can credibly expect is maybe 50%. So we're thinking 15 to 50% of the problem can be handled with this. This is a pretty aggressive scenario. What this basically says is you're going to double the world's oil and gas infrastructure volumetrically just to handle CO2. Can you do it? Yeah. Is that easy? No. Is that likely? You know, we'll see. But, that, that, but this gives you a sense of sort of what the range of what's involved and also the scale of the effort. The main thing to communicate is it's a portfolio of stuff, and this is one of the things you put in the portfolio. You put conservation in the portfolio, energy efficiency, nuclear power, renewables. All these things are options that are on the table. Sequestration is a big one because it can get you one to three of these wedges. In terms of cost, this may come as a surprise to a lot of people. Today, it's cost competitive with a lot of these other options. Crudely speaking, on a levelized playing field, it's about equal to nuclear and it's about equal to wind. There's going to be places where it's better for one versus the other. It's not going to be true globally, but crudely speaking, that's the case. It uses proven technology. Part of the reason we like this is because there's no miracle requ miracles required. And as I'm going to show you later, we've actually been doing this for quite a long time. And that's an important take-home lesson from this. 
A very important aspect of this technology is you can use it both to new and existing plants. We actually can retrofit a power plant for carbon capture and put the CO2 underground. So you can take whatever fleet of fossil fuel emissions you have today and do something about it. So that's an important option to keep on the table. The last point is that there are dramatic rooms for cost reduction. Today, the costs that I talked about, we can get into the details of this later, but they're sort of right ballpark. Um, just the same way that there's learning by doing cost reductions in all the technology elements on the table, the same is true for carbon capture and sequestration. On a thermodynamic basis, we're only doing these separations at about 5% thermodynamic efficiency. That means we're leaving 9%, 95% efficiency on the table. So can we double the efficiency, half the cost of this? Yeah, we can do that. Can we maybe qu quarter the cost of this? Quite credibly, but we actually have to do the work to do so. That capture and separation is the high cost element. And you really can't do carbon capture and sequestration unless you do that. The reason why is because, from let's say from a natural gas power plant, four to seven percent of the flue stream is CO2, pretty much the rest is nitrogen, so you spend all your time and money compressing nitrogen, which isn't very useful. So you need to concentrate to 95% CO2 or more. And there's three different ways pathways that we have to do this. And out of those three pathways, there's maybe 20 technologies that are on the table that we can use to do this. You can either separate it post-combustion, you have a flue stream, grab the CO2 out of it, usually with a chemical sorbent or a membrane, and then you've got it. Alternatively, you can separate pre-combustion. If you have coal or biomass or natural gas, you can separate the carbon out ahead of time through a variety of processes, gasification, water gas shift, steam methane reformation, whatever, you can pull the CO2 out you have hydrogen on one side and CO2 on the other, and again, off you go. The last thing you can do is you can burn your fuels in a pure oxygen environment. In this case, uh, instead of now where it's about you know, 22% oxygen and the rest is nitrogen, what you do is you just have in your uh, combustion chamber all oxygen. And that can either be something like 25% oxygen and the rest is CO2. That will keep you from, say, melting your furnace. Alternatively, you can use just a little bit of oxygen and a little bit of fuel. And that's another way to do it and still maintain sort of the balances that you need. There are perfectly viable technologies for all of these. These have all been done, and we have the costs pretty well circumscribed. So what you're looking at, first of all, here is an amine stripping plant. This is essentially post-combustion technology that they're using on the Spliker platform. Um, this is about an 80-year-old technology. It's been used for a long time. If you wonder where the CO2 in your beer comes from, it comes from this. Um, another way to do it is gasification and separation. We've got an integrated gasifying combined cycle plants in the U.S. We have separated gas from CO2. There's many things that have been done, and this is, again, a technology that we understand fairly well. Selexol is the physical sorbent of choice to do this with. California's very young clean energy systems has developed a power block, which burns pure oxygen and uh, natural gas. And uh, this is a very interesting and important technology, but this is one way in which you can do oxygen-fired combustion. And we actually have a working power plant in California that does this today. It's a small plant, five megawatts, but it works. It's been capturing CO2 for, for a while now, for a bit over a year. So these are the rounded up costs for these things. It's for the capture, you're really talking about 40 to 60 bucks, bucks a ton. For post-combustion capture for a conventional coal plant, it's a bit more for a natural gas plant, but it's not out of sight. Uh, for a gasification plant, 30 to 50 bucks, oxygen-fired combustion, or about the same as a PC plant, although we have a lot less experience with that, so there's a lot more risk in taking that on. An important point is there are actually low-cost opportunities as well. Low-cost opportunities are places where you already have a pure CO2 stream. For example, a hydrogen plant, where you're already making hydrogen on one side and CO2 on the other. Natural gas processing facilities, ethanol plants, refineries, fertilizer plants, all of these things produce pure streams of CO2. So for there, the only thing you're paying for is the cost of transportation and compression. That's what that five to 10 bucks is, okay? And there are a lot of those sources in California that are worth considering. Uh, first of all, what do we know about this that says that we can do this safely? Well, the first thing we know is that the crust can store buoyant fluids. We know this because it has. It's put oil and gas underground for tens and hundreds of millions of years. The third bullet is put CO2 underground for tens and hundreds of millions of years. And in fact, in the United States, there are many uh, pure CO2 domes, naturally occurring domes that hold huge volumes, hundreds of trillions of cubic feet of CO2. Uh, we actually have uh, 3,000 miles of CO2 pipelines in this country. We actually move huge volumes of CO2 around the country today, effortlessly, that falls under the U.S. Department of Transportation. They're the body who get, handles the regulatory authority for it. 
Uh, we actually inject huge volumes of stuff underground every year, stuff that's a lot more hazardous than CO2, like natural gas, which blows up. You use CO2 to put out the fires, but you start with natural gas. Um, but but we, put, we have tens of thousands of natural gas storage facilities around the country. Every year, we inject large volumes of natural gas into them and pull them out. We've done that pretty well. We have a terrific safety record in those. Uh, what, one of the things that most people don't know are the last two bullet points. First of all, we've actually already injected hundreds of millions of tons underground. We've done this mostly in the context of enhanced oil recoveries, but it's worked pretty well. We've got over 80 projects implemented worldwide. The largest of these in West Texas injects 4 million tons of CO2 a year. So it's the right kind of volume, the right kind of scale. There are also three projects which people talk about as commercial sequestration projects, where for whatever reason, a policy reason, an economic driver, whatever, we've actually got places where just to keep the CO2 underground, we're injecting large volumes down there. And I'm going to talk about those in a minute. Each of those is a million tons a year, which is a substantial volume. So how does it work? The first thing you're talking about here is you're not talking about a gas. You're talking about a supercritical fluid. And basically what this means is that it has a density and a viscosity that's more liquid-like. It's about, it's in between oil and natural gas. It has a density close to oil. It has a viscosity about 10 times less than oil. But those are the kinds of properties in the crust. Um, in order to do that, you need to get it down basically below about a kilometer of crust, really 800 meters, but it's a good rounding number. Once you put it down there, there's many different mechanisms that trap and store the CO2 in the subsurface. The first of these is physical trapping. It works just like an oil and gas field. You have a porous impermeable unit like the gray one. It's capped by an impermeable unit, the red one. If you inject it into the gray one, it floats up and it's trapped beneath the red one because the capillary forces in that rock trap it in place. Um, there's also what's called residual phase trapping. This is the capillary forces not in the cap rock but in the reservoir. Um, Essentially, if, if you have a lot of CO2 in a pore, it's mobile. It can move around. But once it moves out, a little bit of it is trapped behind by the capillary forces in that pore. It's basically the same reason you throw your clothes in the dryer. Even after you wring them out, they're wet. That still water in those clothes trapped in the pores. The same thing happens here. There's still CO2 that gets trapped. And that's basically permanently. The only way to get the CO2 out is you have to flush it out or sweep it out or pump it out. Over longer time scales, that CO2 turns into perio. It actually forms carbonated water. It dissolves into that. And the important point here is that the carbonated water is more dense than the water around it. So it doesn't seek the surface of the earth anymore. It's again, it's permanently bound in the subsurface. The only way to get it out is to pump it out. Over longer time scales, it actually then converts into new minerals. It forms carbonic acid, which forms new carbonate minerals in the subsurface. At that point, the only way to get the CO2 out again is plate tectonics. You actually have to make a new mountain range and weather it to get the CO2 out. The take-home message for this is that what you're looking at for any good site is multiple mechanisms working in concert over different time scales, over different length scales. And as time progresses, you get more and more of that CO2 moving into these immovable phases. So sites become more secure over time. And this is one of the important things that we've learned over the last decade of research. So if you, how do you know this site's a good site? It's a perfectly good question to ask. I keep saying, if you have a good site then, well, how do you know? Basically, to have a good site, you need three things. You need injectivity, you need capacity, and you need effectiveness, ICE. These are the three things. The injectivity is the rate term. If you have a 1,000 megawatt natural gas-fired power plant, then you'll be making 3 million tons of CO2 a year that you've got to put someplace, and you have to do that every year. So you need an injectivity in the rocks that can handle that volume. You need capacity. That capacity is the bulk term. If you have that plant and you run it for 60 years, you're going to put 180 million tons of carbon dioxide in the subsurface. You better have enough rock that's good, to, that's good for it. Um, if you don't have injectivity and you don't have capacity, you don't have a project. You don't have a site. And a lot of people don't sort of, haven't got their rounds or brains around that. There's parts of the world where you have these things. There's parts of the world where you don't. And if you don't have these things, you shouldn't be considering a project. Even if you have those things, you're not done because you have to make sure the CO2 is stored effectively, that it stays underground. And by that, we mean long beyond the lifetime of the project. If you inject CO2 for 60 years, it has to stay there for more than five. You know, it's got to stay there for some long time after that. And the community is still wrestling with what exactly that means. But certainly, we're talking about at least tens, possibly hundreds of years where the CO2 remains underground. The reason why we choose those kinds of numbers is because of what the goal of sequestration is. And, and this is something, again, which is sort of often lost in the conversation. 
The goal of carbon sequestration is not permanent isolation containment. That's not the reason you do this. It's not to keep CO2 away from people. CO2, our bodies make CO2. The reason we're doing this is to keep it out of the atmosphere for a while. We want to keep it out of the atmosphere so we can bridge to a decarbonized technology, to where we have a carbon-free infrastructure. And if we can get over the next 100 years, if we can get over the next 500 years, that's entirely worth the price of engagement. So how do we do this, John? How do we actually say, well, we've got injectivity, we've got capacity, we've got effective storage? Well, the good news is that's all off-the-shelf technology, too. It varies from site to site. Each site is specific, but we know how to collect this data, both for saline aquifers and for depleted oil and gas fields. And we do this using conventional hydrologic data sets, conventional oil and gas exploration and production measures. There's a whole suite of tools, drilling wells, shooting seismic volumes, which we can use to understand this and to see this well. Which gets us to the issue of the cost of this part. Um, the assessment piece, choosing a good site, as I said before, it's the first thing you do and it's the most important thing you do. Something that most people don't understand is when you're talking about a large project, it's also by every measure the cheapest thing you do, by a lot. So let's say that the costs of capture are somewhere between 40 and 60 bucks a ton, like I was saying about before. The costs of storage are mostly the costs of drilling wells. And I usually use a number like five to 10, but actually the number is more like 50 cents to 12 bucks per, per ton. But there's a range of costs, but it's basically a factor of 10 cheaper than capture. The costs of monitoring, which I'm gonna talk about, are a factor of 10 cheaper than that. Because you're talking, because that's on the order of 50 cents a ton for the for the monitoring fee. The assessment piece is a factor of 100 cheaper than that. We're talking about fractions of a cent per ton to do the assessment. The reason why is because if you have 180 million tons that are going underground at your plant, and you spend five million dollars doing your assessment or 20 million dollars doing your assessment, that's going to be a lot cheaper than the cost of building and running that thing for 60 years and putting all that CO2 in the ground. It's also important to get the permitting. It's important to avoid hazard. It's important to make sure that you've chosen a good site. It's important for public buy-in. There's all kinds of reasons that this work needs to be done and it shouldn't be shortchanged. It's really incredibly important. Thankfully, that work has been done in a bunch of places. As I said before, there's three projects. Those are the ones in the red stars where people are sequestering CO2 today and I'm gonna talk about each of those in just a moment. The green stars are places where we've been doing CO2 injection for enhanced soil recovery. Again, there's about 80 projects in the United States. Uh, some of those quite large, 4 million tons a year, 2 million tons a year. There's a big project in Trinidad that's been running since 1974. Most people don't know this, but we've, Trinidadians have been injecting more than a million tons of CO2 a year for 25 years. You know, that's just no big deal. The yellow stars are the projects that are gonna come online within the next five years. And there's a lot of big projects that are going to come online in the next five years. The biggest of these is actually in the northwest uh, shelf of Australia. That's the Gorgon Project. That's going to come online in about two years, in 2008-2009 uh, time frame. And that's going to inject uh, about six million tons of carbon dioxide underground. That number, six million tons, is the same amount of CO2 that comes out of a thousand megawatt coal-fired power plant. So we're going to have the proof of concept right there. We've already gotten pretty far with the one million ton tests that I'm about to talk about. Importantly, one of the things that we know about these projects is that we haven't learned what we need to out of them. We still haven't spent the time and money to do the science that we need to do to answer the questions that a lot of people have. So we continue to need these large projects as a learning mechanism to get us to the place where all the stakeholders involved are gonna be satisfied. The first of these projects was Sleipner. This began in 1996. This was driven entirely by a policy and economic decision. The Norwegian government said, it'll cost you $50 a ton to vent the CO2. They said it'll cost us $15 a ton to capture it and sequester it. That's what we're gonna do. So since 1996, they've been injecting a million tons a year. They've put 11 million tons of carbon dioxide underground at this site into a saline formation. And here it is. What you're looking at here is essentially an ultrasound of the earth. We send sound waves down to the subsurface, they reverberate back, it's called uh, time-lapse seismic, but what you're looking at is basically an ultrasound of the Earth. And like an ultrasound, if, for those of you who have seen ultrasounds of babies, the only reason that you know it's a baby is because somebody told you. You, 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 know, you need to know what you're looking at to interpret it. Well, the same thing's the case here. What you're looking at is between 1994 and 1999, you see that there are these reflection horizons that have appeared. That's CO2 that are trapped within the reservoir. 
And one of the things you can see is that it hasn't come out of the reservoir. The top of the reservoir in the 2001 line is that bright red line. No CO2 has escaped from there. There have been two more surveys, one in, I think, 2004, another one in 2006. They show the same thing. So we've been monitoring this injection for 10 years, and there's been no demonstrable leakage. The resolution of this tool is about 10,000 tons. So we've injected 11 million tons. We know that 10,000 tons haven't leaked out. That means we're good to 99.9% .9 of the injected. So again, that passes the lab test. And this work got people excited enough to start thinking about this broadly. The next big project to come online was Weyburn in Canada. Here they're taking a pure CO2 stream, one of these low-cost options I talked about, from a gasification plant in North Dakota. Pan-Canadian built a 200-mile pipeline to inject it into their oil field. They're injecting about 5,000 tons a day, a little less than a million tons a year. The reason they're doing this is because they're going to get an extra 130 million barrels of oil out of this. However, before they started, they said, we are going to store the CO2. We're going to demonstrate that it stores, stayed there for a long time. That's a commitment to this project. And we're also going to put together a $24 million science program to demonstrate that point. They did regional hydrologic work. They did a bunch of work on hazards and assessments. But they also collected monitoring information. In this case, a number of tools. This is the seismic maps that you see. And again, you can see the same sort of thing. These are map view kinds of things. And you, the impedance contrast you're seeing here, the bright colors are places where CO2 has gone to the subsurface. And by looking at these you know, slices, again, they've been able to demonstrate that it has stayed in the reservoir as predicted. The last project is the Insala project. This one is being driven, strangely enough, entirely by corporate goodwill. Uh, this is a gas project in Algeria. I tell you, the Algerian government doesn't care if you vent CO2. But here, the BP is the primary operator, and they said, we care if we vent CO2. They've mapped the reservoir. That white stuff is the permeable zones. That's where you have injectivity and capacity. The black stuff is where you don't. So they said, we can inject CO2 into the water leg of this gas field. They spent $100 million building this separation plant, and they spent $30 million a year compressing and injecting it down into this reservoir. And the reason why they're doing that is because they expect this is an important technology in the future, and they want to be the best at it. And that's going to give them a commercial advantage. From looking at these projects go forward, we have some idea about what it's going to take to actually commercialize this technology, what it's going to take to bring this into the public sphere to the point where you actually have large amounts of CO2 sequestration. And what this diagram shows you is sort of a life cycle of a project, and there's basically two parts. The yellow boxes are tasks that an operator has to do. The green boxes are decisions that are made by people. Sometimes those people are regulators, like the EPA. Sometimes they're financiers or insurers. Sometimes they're the operators themselves. But they collect information in the yellow boxes, and they make decisions in the green boxes. And basically what you're talking about is first you look for a site. Once you select it, you do a characterization before you inject. It goes into the permitting. Once you actually get the green light and you can permit the project, you start monitoring it before you inject because you need to know what it looked like before you injected so that you can see what happens afterwards. Then you begin injection. Then you get this box. This box lasts for 50 years, something like that, in which you monitor and you operate the site. At some point, you end it. And when it's done, you decommission the project. When that's done, you still monitor because you have to make sure that it's behaving the way you expected it to and that the CO2 that goes down stays down. At some point after that, everybody says, we're happy with what you've done, and work ceases at the site. There's a number of sort of bottlenecks in this process. And the f there's those four bottlenecks are basically, first, we don't actually have good capacity assessments on a state level or a national level. It's just stuff we don't know. It's, we, as a result, on a case basis, you select sites. You can't look at a state map and go, we know exactly where the best place to store CO2 is. We know where the best resource is. Let's think about how to work that. The second thing that we don't have is we don't have protocols for operators. An operator is sitting here going, I've got to fill those yellow boxes. I don't know what I have to do. I don't know what's the minimum level of due diligence. I don't know what's overkill versus not enough. The next choke point is we don't have a regulatory framework. Somebody at Cal EPA might go, well, maybe I can permit the well, but what does this mean? How do I permit a project? What's area of review? What's actually the regulatory and legal basis in which this goes forward? And that's still up in the air. The last one is human resources. There are not enough people to do this. 
Anybody who can do this work can get triple their salary at an oil and gas company. There's just not enough manpower to do what needs to be done. So these are, these are the four bottlenecks. And the thing that I want to leave you with that I think is of incredible importance in talking about sequestration is none of these is a technical bottleneck. There's still technical information that goes into it. You want to design a regulatory framework or you want to collect the data that you need at your site as a protocol. You want that to be technologically sound and well advised. But we're not, there's no miracles needed to do this. We do this as a matter of course all the time with other kinds of projects. So what we're talking about here are at heart questions of public acceptance, questions of deployment, questions of policy. And that's a very, very important place to be with this technology. It's one of the things that makes it so attractive. One of the big questions that people have about this technology is, well, I inject the CO2 underground, then what happens? That's a good question. It's a perfectly valid and reasonable thing. And if a lot of CO2 came back to the surface, that would be a problem. And so you try to avoid substantial leaks, and for a number of reasons. The first of these is really high concentrations of CO2 will kill you. And so you pretty much want to avoid that. Um, by really high, I mean really high, 10% in the atmosphere. So that's basically almost a, a factor of 50 to 100 more than where we are today. Okay, so you need a lot of CO2 uh, to really cause harm, but you still want to avoid that. Things can go wrong. Um, you also don't want to do things that contaminate groundwater. I think everybody agrees with that. I think uh, one of the issues is actually if you're going to bother to do this, you want the CO2 to stay down. If you're going to spend this extra money and this extra cost to sequester the CO2, then it should do what it's supposed to do. And the last part is there's economic risk. If you're trying to you know, get it under a cap and trade, or you're getting paid to do it or whatever, you actually have to make sure that this works as advertised. The good news is that we actually really understand what the risks are. They're wells. There are other risks, but the risks are mostly wells. Uh, beyond that, there's wells and wells, there's faults, and then there's wells. Um, wells are where all of that stuff that I talked about, all that great process trapping mechanism doesn't work anymore. You punch the hole through the rocks, so the rocks don't do that anymore. The reason you drill a well is to bring a large volume of fluid to the surface quickly. And so that's where something could potentially go wrong. The good news is, A, we have some understanding of how wells can fail. There's actually been a decent amount of work on this. What are all the possible things that can go wrong? One thing people need to know is that we can identify old and abandoned wells. What you're looking at here is an aeromagnetic map of an oil field in uh, Wyoming. And this is technology developed by National Energy Technology Lab. They pass an aeromagnetic boom over the field, and buried wells show up as magnetic monopoles. So you can find old abandoned wells. If there was one missing that you didn't know about before, Hosanna. And then you can go in and plug in and recomplete them. That's the last part. We actually know how to design CO2 injection wells. We've been doing that for 30 years. We know how to plug and abandon these things, because we've been doing that for 30 years. So this is, again, this is, the, this is a real hazard you should worry about. But again, no miracles required. It's a question of diligence. It's a question of management. It's not a question of technology. It is reasonable to ask, let's say that you missed a well and something went horribly wrong. We did some work at Livermore to try to figure out what that might look like. And one of the things we did is we went to a CO2 geyser in Utah. It's called Crystal Geyser. This was a well that was built in 1936. The people were looking for oil. They didn't find it. They found CO2. They walked away and abandoned the well unplugged, and it's been erupting ever since. And by erupting, you can see it. There, there's a big eruption there. It gets 10-meter tall fountains. There's no thermal property about this. It's all just CO2 concentration provides the drive. The water is 16 degrees Celsius by pit. Well, a couple of things that you can get from this picture. First of all, these people standing in front of it aren't really worried. Uh, and I've got, you know, you'll see I've got pictures of children playing in this. I mean, it's, this is not Chernobyl. It's a different kind of thing. In fact, it's a tourist attraction. The city of uh, Green River has been trying to figure out how to make it more explosive, more exciting. The, um, but uh, another thing uh, that's important to know about this is what the volume of the flux is. What, what happens when a well goes really bad? And we did some work around this. Um, and we went out and actually measured the flux from this kind of well. Turns out it's about 50 tons a day. First order of business, 50 tons a, a day would be about the same. If I had a CO2 canister here and I turned it on, that would be about 50 bucks tons a day. Crudely speaking, that's what it's talking about. You guys wouldn't drop dead on the spot if I did that. And the people who are playing in this fountain, or this geyser, are not dropping dead either. Okay, 50 tons is not that much. Another way to think about 50 tons 
is if you missed this eruption for a year, somehow you were really bad at your monitoring and you had a well that came up on jetting 10 meter vents of CO2 into the air for a year, that would be about 9,000 tons of CO2. Now, if you're injecting a million tons a year, that's less than 1% of your injection. So it's not like it goes down and comes back up. There's actually limitations to how fast it can come back out of the ground. Now, we did some simulation to try to figure out what a plume would look like. And we actually gathered data at the site. We went out and correct, collected an array of the flux data to figure this out. And then we simulated that eruption, these events. And this is what the plume looks like. The thing that you need to know about these colors is that the darkest blue in the center of it is greater than 100 parts per million above background. Once you get outside that smallest blue circle, you basically can't detect it anymore. It's getting to the point where you could stand there with a CO2 meter and not see an eruption that big if you were 200 feet away. That's the concentration of CO2 that's in the atmosphere. Should you still worry about it? Absolutely, because not everything looks like this. It might come into a low-lying area. It could be a cool, still day and CO2 pond. There's things that can go wrong. So we came up with saying, well, if we have this point source and we have some terrain we didn't know anything about, there could be a well anywhere in here, what should we be worried about? What should we care about that's credible? And we did this analysis, and basically where there's colors are places where there's an elevated risk of CO2 uh, collecting. This is about 3% of the land area. So what this means is if you're going to be doing a project in this area, this is where you need to do extra due diligence. This is where you need to put some extra monitoring technology on the ground. This is where you need to do extra surveying to make sure that there isn't a large leak or a large hazard nearby. It doesn't mean you run away from it, but you need to know that this is going on so that you can appropriately ensure the safe and effective deployment of CO2. You also need to monitor it. I talked about this before. Monitoring serves a bunch of different roles, not the least of which is, you know, if you're going to be paid to put it underground, people want to know what they're getting for their money. If it's either because of you're under a cap and trade or you're under a carbon tax or somebody is paying you for offsets, whatever the reasons are, there's value in doing this and people want to understand their value. That's why you monitor. Obviously also public safety, obviously to learn stuff about science and, uh, and what's going on in the subsurface. The good news is, news is there's only a small number of parameters you care about. You want to know where the CO2 is. You might want to know its concentration in the subsurface. You might want to know if it's making stress changes. You might want to know if it's coming back up to the surface. You know, these are things that you want, would want to know about. And there are a huge number of tools to do this with, all of which have been vetted and tested in many arenas. Uh, many of them have actually been used in CO2 pilots in various locations. So again, there's quite a lot to think about and to understand with this. And uh, uh, there is, uh, these are just what I consider to be my personal favorite tools to do this with. This is not a, you know, the only way to do it. But there are certainly, again, many tools that you can use to, to do this. The question you should be asking yourself at this point is not can we monitor, but what's the least we need to know? What's the least monitoring we need to do to ensure public safety? Because we need to ensure public safety. But we don't want to foist an undue burden on people. We don't want to have them gold plate everything. So what's credible? What do we actually need to understand what's the lowest level of due diligence? And that, I mean, we don't have a good answer for that yet. That's one of these things where some technical investigation would work. I'm going to spend the rest of my time focusing on California and the West because I think this is so important. The Western region is just at the center of national action and interest. And of course, uh, AB 32 is driving a lot of decision making in the state as it should. Uh, it's a landmark legislation. Um, it's a national and global leadership in, in the best sense of the word. At the same time, SB 1368 came on the boards, and that's sort of a, a structural change that gives us a mechanism to think about this. Essentially, you can't have a long-term power contract without at least hitting a natural gas combined cycle standard of 1,100 pounds per megawatt. Um, in addition to that, the Western Governors Association is crafting their carbon markets initiative that's going on in real time. Uh, Washington has adopted the SB 1368 standard. Other states are likely to follow. In California, we've got AB 1922, 1925, and the document was just deliv delivered to the legislature this year talking about uh, what we think are important aspects of carbon sequestration. Uh, that was a, uh, done in part with the, carbon, uh, was with the California Energy Commission, groups from West Carb, who you hear about later, uh, many groups I was involved in that. That was a fairly big effort. And there are many actions pending in other states around the West. These are the groups that are at the forefront about this. As an example, within the next two weeks, the Wyoming legislature is going to decide who owns the core surface in the state. And they're going to make that law. We don't know who it's going to be. Is it going to be mineral rights? Is it going to be surface rights? They don't know yet, but they're going to make that decision. 
And that's going to make it easier for people to do capture and sequestration projects in the West. Now, because of SB 1368, coal by wire becomes an issue in California. If you want to have a lot of power in California, about 20% of the power today comes from coal by wire. Now, those power contracts are going to lapse, at which point they either have carbon sequestration on those plants or the contract goes away. So a lot of the Western governors, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, are all looking at carbon sequestration as a way in which they can continue to sell power supplies to the West. And it's going to be very, very important on that front. But I really want to focus on California. And it's worth knowing what we've, what we've got. The first thing we've got is we've got a great sequestration resource. Conservative estimate says 300 gigatons of capacity. This was pulled together by the California Geological Survey for West Carbon, the DOE. Almost all of that is in the Central Valley. That's the best sequestration resource we've got in the state. It's worth knowing this is 10,000 times more than the ensemble of California's point emissions. So there's, we're not going to be resource limited on this one. That's not going to be the problem. Um, these are also other big resources in the West. On the, the diagram on the right, it's kind of hard to understand. What you're looking at are stratigraphic columns for the, southern, for the San Joaquin Basin. And the yellow units are basically all units you can eject CO2 into. And the white units are basically seals that trap the CO2. So we get an abundance of resource and abundance of trapping mechanisms. Site characterization, however, is needed to turn these sort of reserves estimates into actual projects. Now, the potential benefits to California are large. Some of these are going to be manifested in the long term, but some of these you can go after in the short term, too. So the lower diagram is, a, is the large point sources in California from the power's perspective, and basically all the yellow dots are large, big, natural gas-fired power plants. Okay? The upper right has a diagram that shows you the location of all the uh, low-cost opportunities, places where we have high concentration stream of CO2 in the state today. These include refineries, gas processing facilities, cement plants. These are places where we can do it. For the state, I just don't believe that there's going to be a lot of large coal-fired power plants sited in California anytime soon. I just don't. But uh, carbon capture and sequestration is not a coal-only technology, and you can apply it in the state in four arenas that I think are important. Refineries, cement plants, zero-emission gas plants, and in conjunction with biofuels. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about all these. Now, refineries are a critical, a critical industry in the state. They're going to be important under AB 32 to making sure that we hit the fuel emission standards. They're also where our fuel comes from. California has its own emission standards, and we have to hit those, and the refineries in California are the ones that make that. They are also large emitters. They emit criteria pollutants. They emit large volumes of CO2. Well, right now, we're in a position where these refineries want to expand to make more oil, to make more gasoline, but they can't expand because of criteria pollutant restrictions. And the number of permits have been denied on that basis alone, including carbon emissions. Now, if the costs of offsetting these industries become too high, they will offshore. These refineries will close, and we'll be doing refining in some other part of the country or some other part of the world. That's likely not only to drive up costs, but also drive up emissions. Because then we won't only have the emissions of the refinery, we'll have the emissions of the barges that bring it to the sea. Well, we can capture and sequester the pure streams of CO2 today. Refineries have hydrogen plants in them. The byproduct of those hydrogen plants are pure streams of CO2. Today, those are sequestration ready. There's nothing to stop us from building a pipeline from Richmond to some repository or sequestration target somewhere in the Central Valley. That's technically, legally, operationally feasible. You have to decide that you want to do it for whatever reason. You have to decide you want to pay for it, but that decision can be done. There are also new technologies available to capture the rest of it. So, for example, a certain amount of CO2 comes from catalytic cracking. Well, because of the temperature and pressures of those processes, you can apply new technologies in there that, again, will scrub the CO2 out and concentrate it. So there are opportunities here that are unique to the refining industry that are important in the context of California. This approach, if you combine it with the capture and sequestration of criteria pollutant emissions, and I'll talk about that after my talk, then you can actually both re dramatically reduce the emissions from refinery and potentially increase the production with it, and that that's a target worth considering. Cement is another one. Cement represents 3% of California's emissions. The reason why is because when you make cement, you take limestone and you turn it into calcium oxide on one side and CO2 on the other. You just make a lot of CO2. 
of the flue gas comes from that part of it. You just have lots of CO2 when you make cement. This is, again, one of these situations where if the costs get too high because they're purchasing offsets or because the regulatory burden becomes too heavy, then these plants shut down. They build plants, cement plants in China and Australia, and they ship us the cement. That offshores the jobs. That offshores the emissions with it. That's not a great place to be. Now, at Livermore, we've done a little bit of work looking at capture technologies that are uniquely suited to the cement industry because, again, there are specific temperature and pressure and material things that matter with it. One of the things we've hit on is actually using uh, the cement kiln dust that's a waste product from some of these plants to actually do the capture and sequestration at low cost. So here you actually handle the criteria pollutants. Socks and NOx are also taken up with that. The CO2 is also taken up with it. And you also have to re remove the solid waste, which is a byproduct of the stream. And so we've been talking to a number of cement plants, and we're just beginning now a research a program around that in collaboration with that industry. Now, if you really want to get to AB32, then we're going to have to go after natural gas emissions, too. And this is not the necessarily the front burner issue. There's many things that one can go after. But as I said at the beginning of this talk, there's an urgency around emission reductions. And that means that you have to consider natural gas. It may be that in not too long, the SB 1368 standard of 1,100 pounds per megawatt is considered too high. And people start ratcheting down further, 800 pounds, 600 pounds, to further decarbonize the power sector. Well, right now the natural gas plants provide 20 million, 25 million tons of CO2 in California. Under SB 1368, we're probably going to see more of those plants because the demand for power is going up, and that's pretty much the only kind of stuff that can get permitted. Renewables, yes, but natural gas as well. Now, again, we have technology options in the state, oxy-fire and combustion. One of the things that I don't think a lot of people have recognized is that just like any other renewable resource, uh, renewable technology, I should say, people talk about the green-collar jobs. I know Dan Cameron was here talking about that yesterday. This works here, too. This is export technology that could be developed in the state. We could become global leaders in carbon capture. We can become global leaders in carbon sequestration. And we can do that through technology development and application. If we don't do that, if we want to do sequestration in the future, we'll be buying that from Norway or Australia or some other vendor, and it won't be from the United States. And again, that will be an opportunity where California has today to show leadership in this arena and to develop technology that can be sold in other places. Last is biofuels. Um, everybody understands that biofuel plants have a carbon reduction associated with them because the plant takes CO2 out of the air, and then you burn it. And so it's kind of a closed carbon loop. It's obviously not really closed. You guys know that. But you can do that. What most people haven't thought about is if you combine carbon capture and sequestration with a conventional biofuels plant, you have a negative emissions power plant. The plants take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, and then you put it underground. It's the only technology we have today that can take CO2 out of the atmosphere actually at a reasonable cost. That's worth going after. If you need to make deep reductions quickly, you can make a negative emission power plant and get there. You can do it using agricultural waste in the Central Valley. It's also true with liquid biofuels. Currently, about a third of the carbon from biofuels manufacturing goes into the fuel itself. About a third of the carbon goes into waste products like glycerol. And about a third goes into CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. Well, you can capture that CO2 and sequester it underground from an ethanol plant, from a biodiesel refinery, whatever you want to do. If you do that, you'll basically have the carbon value of that fuel. If you're blending that fuel with conventional fuels to hit that AB32 low carbon emission standard for your fuels, you can further reduce it through carbon capture and sequestration. There's another way to say this, um, which is how do you combine carbon and capture and sequestration with sectoral carbon reductions in general? And this is recent data, 2007, from the EPA, in which they looked at a bunch of different options. And there's a couple of them that are circled here. One of them, which I know a lot of people have problems with, is cold to liquids. Cold to liquids, crudely speaking, have double the CO2 footprint of conventional gasoline. Excuse me. Well, if you combine it with carbon capture and sequestration, it has about the same carbon footprint as gasoline. That's not enough for California, but you can certainly get there. The second circle over to the right is if you combine, if you combine coal to liquids with biomass combustion. If you throw about 20% biomass in there, what does that get you? What it gets you is 35% less carbon than gasoline. Cold to liquids plus biomass plus sequestration gets you a substantial 
carbon reduction. The circle that's next to it, the oval over on the far left, is what happens if you take corn ethanol and combine it with carbon sequestration. And corn ethanol is the blue bar at 22%. If you combine that with carbon capture and sequestration, you double the benefits of it because about an equal volume of carbon is in the fuel as goes into the CO2. So again, you have the opportunity to make more dramatic reductions by combining CCS with all of these technologies. And that's true in m many sectors, and that's true in the global market. And sort of this is where I'm going to try to wind down a bit. Sequestration can reduce the carbon footprint for all many transportation options. So this graph is one that I picked up from BP. Basically, I fleeced it from BP. And uh, on one axis, the horizontal axis is concern about climate change and need to reduce carbon. On the vertical axis is energy security. Do we have secure domestic supplies? That kind of thing. And all of these technologies can com compete in the marketplace in various ways. Carbon-free hydrogen competes with heavy oil in the market. It really does. And depending on how the market values these things, security versus the carbon footprint, depends which of these do better. Well, one of the nice things about carbon capture and sequestration is it works with many of these. You can reduce the carbon footprint for many of these fuels, including conventional oil and gas, including gas to liquids, including conventional biofuels, including advanced biofuels. If you want to go to cellulosic ethanol, great. Combine it with carbon capture and sequestration. Have your carbon footprint. Same is true in the power sector. All these things compete. If you want to have a hydrogen power project versus gas fire power project versus a solar fire power project, you know, solar thermal or solar PV doesn't matter. These things all compete in the marketplace. The greener options look better in a carbon constrained world. Some of them look better in a security constrained world. Carbon capture and sequestration gets you room to move in all of these. It helps you with gas fire, with coal fire, with biomass, and can make hydrogen for power. It's an enabling technology to that as well. The last point about California is that we've actually got the dream team right here in the state. Hard pressed to think of better people to do this anyway. For starters, you got this interesting mix of point sources, which most states don't. So this gives you an opportunity to develop a range of technologies and try a bunch of things. You have serious high level government engagement. You've got the governor, you've got CARB, you've got CEC, the Department of Oil and Gas, Geothermal Resources. You've got institutions like West Carb, which are coupled with these other ones that provide uh, sort of a breadth of capability, experience, and regulatory authority. You also have some pretty smart folks. You've got the National Labs, Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore, institutions like EPRI and SRI that are major head shops. These people have knowledge that matters. You have terrific CO2 capture engineering groups. Fluor, Bechtel, Nexent, SPA Specific, Clean Energy Systems, you have all of these companies in the state that are working on this. And you've got service companies like URS and Schlumberger in the state that are doing the same thing. You have large energy companies, Chevron, Occidental, that are actually providing leadership around this issue and trying to figure out how to get there. You have terrific universities, an unbelievable brain trust in the form of the UC campuses and Stanford. They just can't think of many better teams to tackle this. And of course, you have a lot of experience. You have operational experience. You have management experience. You've got pipeline right of way experiment experience, all this sort of thing. You also have something that's not here, a large and dedicated group of environmental groups, Natural Resource Defense Council, Environmental Defense, Clean Air Task Force. They're seriously interested in seeing this technology go forward, but are also interested in making sure that it goes forward in a sensible and reasonable way. They want to both be enablers and watchdogs make sure that the public interests and environmental interests are served. I'm not going to say much about this. Our lab is brilliant. We're full of the best people in the world. So we can do whatever you ask us to. Just ask us. <laughs> the main thing, again, is to, to recognize that what this technology really represents. It represents a real opportunity to get dramatic ab abatement of emissions. Everything we know about this suggests that it will work. And it's been very heartening for me in this field for some six years that the more we study it, the better it looks. Every time somebody says, we have to look at this. This is a problem. We study it and go, oh, it's not a problem. It's a feature. You know, it works better than we thought it did. What gaps there are are real, things like how do you design a reasonable monitoring program, but those are resolvable. And you need to do these large-scale projects to figure that out. If you do good site characterization, if you monitor, if you care about the hazards of a site and work that issue, 
you manage those things, you're going to have safe and successful, successful deployment. And the last thing is that California is an opportunity waiting to happen. It's a gold mine of things to do. And the question here, as it is with sequestration in general, is what are going to be the economic incentives? What are going to be the economic signals? What are going to be the policy measures that either help or hinder the deployment of this and all the other uh, clean energy technology that we're trying to bring to bear? Uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. As you mentioned earlier, time is of the essence. Uh, and my ex personal experience with things like the uh, coal gas fire at uh, Cool Water and things like that is that there's not only a very long lead time in developing pilot projects, mm -hmm. but often the pilot projects end up going nowhere, not for lack of technical demonstration, but simply because there hasn't been uh, a concomitant development of an economic infrastructure to make it happen. Is uh, your lab or others, are, do, are other people working on that problem? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, there's, there's two answers I'd like to give to that. One of them is what's the government doing and then what's everybody else doing? Um, the government has built from nothing a sequestration program. Ten years ago its budget was $5 million. This year its budget is $120 million. So they're getting there. But within the, re the sequestration research program, a big chunk of the program is what's called the regional partnership. And you heard me allude to WestCarb as an institution that's one of the seven regional partnerships. Many people are confused and think that the primary mission of that is a technical mission. It isn't. The primary mission of that is actually developing the infrastructure to enable the deployment of the technology. So, for example, there are 23 geological pilot projects that are going forward in the country. Part of the reason to do that is to get local mayors and local regulators and local decision makers learning about sequestration, understanding what it means, and having to make some decisions about it. And, and that's helped to enable the rollout of that. The second thing I would say is what's the rest of the world doing? Uh, this year, the, again, I said the federal budget's $120 million. Last year, BP spent $200 million on it. Industry as a whole in the energy sector, not in the power sector, in the energy sector spent about a billion dollars. Um, the power sector and the coal sector is starting to come up the curve. The thing that makes me excited, that makes me think something's going to happen, is that the money people, the financiers, the insurance industry, they're now serious about this. One measure of that is actually um, uh, Swiss Re, the world's largest uh, insurer and reinsurer, will not insure a project that doesn't meet certain carbon emission standards. Another measure of that is they've held a meeting last year in Zurich, and they said, we will permit every aspect of this as long as it passes muster by us, with one exception, which is the long-term liability test. So they'll permit the rest of it, and they'll insure it. So I think, again, the, the, the market signals are sort of getting me in the right place. Um, before we take another one from the audience, let me take a web question. Uh, this is from, uh, let me start with first with uh, Zhen Hong Lin uh, from ARB. He said, uh, the question is, how much consensus do scientists have regarding the technological and economic feasibility of CCS? Um, Within the community of people who work on this, uh, so just as a measure, the last International Carbon Sequestration Conference was made about 1,000 people. The consensus is overwhelming and resounding. One measure of that consensus was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the one who puts out the assessment reports, put out a document at the end of 2005, which was an assessment of carbon capture and sequestration technology. And uh, there was a group of some 30 scientists. They received over 1,000 comments in the first round, a similar amount in the second round. It went through exhaustive peer review. It was signed off on by all the nations involved. They said, it is very likely that we can keep 99.9% .9 of the CO2 underground from a well-chosen site for at least 100 years. And it is very likely that we can keep, from a, if you choose your site well, that you can keep 99% of the CO2 underground for 1,000 years. So that's a reasonably good uh, consensus kind of argument. There have been many, many similar studies by other groups that come to that same notion. Uh, question here. Uh, thank, you, thank you for your presentation. Um, 
I was interested in looking at the economics a little bit more closely. Mm -hmm. uh, two points that you made was you said you could reduce the cost uh, by two times or four times, depending upon mm -hmm. uh, whatever. You, and you didn't really go into how you would do that. You said what you didn't say how. Mm -hmm. And is that being pursued? That's my first question. And, and how is that being pursued? Um, we're going to start again with, with the federal budget process, which is a great place to start about this. Last year's budget for carbon capture technology research was $13 million. It's not a lot. That said, we're, we're, uh, let me first tell you the context for my comment and then answer your question directly. The context of my comment was the fact that we do gas separations so inefficiently today that to say that we can have or, or quarter the cost by doubling or quadrupling the efficiency is from a thermodynamic basis and a technology basis entirely credible. Now, there are groups out there that are pursuing this, and we've got some large-scale tests going on right now that are worth noting. One of these is a company called Jupiter Oxygen. Uh, they have a process to retrofit conventional boilers, and uh, they are running a 4-megawatt test today. They do it the way the second way that I talked about with oxyfire in small amounts of fuel, small amounts of oxygen um, to manage the, the heat, and they do a lot of work on flame shape. It's sort of an integrated design approach. They say that they can do this with no increase to cost of electricity. I'll believe it when I see it. But that's their starting position, and they're running this 4-megawatt test right now. There's a 5-megawatt post-combustion test going on right now for a chilled ammonia sorbent. It's a novel sorbent for chemical separation post-combustion. Uh, their claim is that they can do it for 11 bucks a ton. We'll see. Um, there's another technology that I personally like that's an enzymatic membrane. A company called Carbozyme in New Jersey does this. They say they can do it for 9 bucks a ton, and they're at their 100 kilowatt test right now. They're not at the 5 megawatt test, but they're, they're getting up there. Um, there are other promising technologies, advanced membrane technologies, like ionic transfer membranes, uh, ultra-thin membranes, uh, uh, novel, novel polymers. Uh, there are uh, very interesting ways to do lower-cost oxygen separation, which is, you know, for oxyfiring, that's the big cost, but if you can do that, you're there, um, using crown ethers, again, advanced membrane technology. So, and... Groups like Air Products, Siemens, Westinghouse, General Electric are starting to put their change into this. So uh, they are starting to get the right market signals to believe that there is an opportunity here. Um, I just, you know, keep your eyes peeled. It's not like you, there's somebody prepared to warranty that today. But uh, we're getting there, and uh, I would be very surprised if in 10 years we don't have at least a halving in cost. 10 years, you said? I, I would be surprised if in 10 years we haven't cut the cost in half. Okay. The second question has to do with um, one of your slides you told showed uh, 40 to 60 dollars per ton of carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. um, and it looked like those are various options for coal. Yeah, that was for a conventional pulverized coal logic test. And it, and gasification and oxyfire combustion. Yeah, the gasification was 35 to 50. Oxyfiring was about the same as PC. Right yeah, 40 to 60. Yeah, and I guess what I was interested in is looking at it in a slightly different way, and that was to take a look at the levelized cost of electricity, mm -hmm. um, including maybe uh, the mm -hmm. any kind of efficiency hit you might have mm -hmm. by se separating out the carbon and look at a broader array of options like comparing it to natural gas versus hydroelectricity yeah. versus, say, nuclear. We had the comment mm -hmm. yesterday at the seminar that you mentioned that by the time you get through adding carbon capture and storage to coal, it costs as much as nuclear. Yeah. Um, I so, so, I, so I guess yeah, well, because the, it's an uh, array of showing, yeah, showing costs for a variety of technologies. Yeah, there's actually quite a lot of that that's been done. Again, the IPCC document spends a lot of time talking both about capture technology and the economics of an integration and how they compare. Um, first of all, uh, let me just get this off my chest. Nobody actually knows the price of nuclear power. Um, I've, I've talked to many, many nuclear engineers about this. They can't give me a good answer. So when people come up with price estimates for the cost of nuclear power, often they say things like, if there's a new build, uh, if we get loan guarantees, if the waste problem is handled by somebody else, and there's all these things that go into it. But the, the, for, let me, try, again, try to answer your question directly now. The number that people kick around, generally speaking, is you're looking at a 50 to 80% increase in the wholesale cost of electricity production for any of these technologies. 50 to 80% cost in wholesale increase. Um, in 2004 numbers, which is, you know, when these, these documents were written, you're talking about maybe $0.04 cents a kilowatt for conventional coal plants. You'd be talking about $0.06 cents a kilowatt. That compared favorably with nuclear power plants in many settings, not in all, but in many. Um, and it compared favorably with 
um, natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration. Um, if you were to do those, that was for 90% capture, it was those cases. If you wanted to do 50% capture, they'd hit the RC1368 standard, the cost would less scale. But there have been a number of groups that have done this kind of analysis. Ed Rubin at Carnegie Mellon, Howard Herzog at MIT, Dale Simbeck at SPA Specific, that have tried to do apples and apples comparisons. And I would direct you to the future of coal report that MIT put out that thinks about this in a pretty omnibus way. If you just go to coal. I think www.mit.edu slash coal gets you that. Uh, let me take another web question. Um, the question from uh, Chris Berry is, if sources of alternative energy are used to create hydrogen by electrolysis, then oxygen is a byproduct. The sequestration of carbon dioxide uh, with the need to separate carbon dioxide and nitrogen from combustion. So basically, if I understand this question properly, what you're saying is if you can have low cost electrolysis of water to make hydrogen, then you might be able to get your oxygen for cheap as a byproduct, which might incentivize oxidizing combustion. Um, I wouldn't dispute that. Actually, one of our scientists is working on a way to do that uh, using wet ocean chemistry, and it's interesting technology. We'll see if it can get off the ground. But um, the, the initial premise, which is that you're going to make hydrogen by electrolysis, is pretty dicey. Um, because if that electricity is not coming from a carbon su free supply, you're making carbon when you're making the hydrogen. And if it is coming from a carbon free supply, then why do you need the hydrogen? You've already got carbon free electricity. So there's, there's, there's the second law sort of hits you pretty hard there, and you're going to be fighting losses at many places along the system. And uh, what, you, what you definitely don't want to do is to sort of you know, make electricity to make hydrogen to make electricity. That's sort of a, a strange thing to do. Second question he has here, it's worth remarking that the combination of fuels, especially coal and oxygen, regardless of how obtained, also produce much higher temperatures. Uh, that's why uh, you either need to do uh, recirculation of the CO2 in order to uh, keep those temperatures down or use very small quantities of oxygen and very small quantities of fuel um, so that you get the right temperature balance in the boiler. If you tried to take a conventional boiler, put in as much fuel as you normally do, and burn that in a clear oxygen environment, you'd melt your system very, very quickly. Um, there is an opportunity, I think, in here for high temperature uh, material development, but uh, we'll get to that in maybe the second or third generation of plants. In the near term, uh, we have two credible ways of doing this, one of which Babcock and Wilcox is prepared to license and guarantee, which is the first option. So I'm pretty sanguine about that as well. Another group here. Yeah, a question. Um, one of the take-homes, I guess, that I'm getting from this um, discussion today is that uh, the risks are known and the risks are not large. And so I, you, one of the risks you focused on was well failure, but mm -hmm. there's, I think, a lot of other risks that deserve mm -hmm. a little more attention. Could you speak to what's happening on, in particular, the transport pipeline risk mm -hmm. and um, hydrological and types of risks, you know, the sure. groundwater, which you mentioned very briefly? Right. Um, uh, first of all, if you want papers on that, um, I wrote uh, an issue on uh, on sort of ha risks and hazards for last year's NEPL conference. Um, you can get that uh, if you just if you Google me and type in NEPL 2007, you'll find the paper. Um, also, uh, recently uh, Elizabeth Wilson and I wrote a paper on this issue um, that came out in Environmental Science and Technology last year. So you can get some information there too. Um, there's three other risks which people sort of come back to on a regular basis. One of them is uh, induced earthquakes, which I didn't talk about. Um, the short answer for that is we totally understand. I wouldn't say we totally understand that. Everything that we know says that that's not a big risk and readily managed. And I can get into the details of that with you offline, but that seems to be the case. Groundwater contamination is one. And here, one of the things we know is that if CO2 were to get into groundwater, it would probably react with minerals and with other components of uh, the groundwater aquifer and release things like VOCs and metals in some way. Um, if it, came in, if it just came into the aquifer and made Perrier, it would be sort of the punchline. But if it really makes Perrier with arsenic, it's a headline, and that's something you want to avoid. Um, that's an area of active research. And there's a number of groups out there. Uh, in fact, Lawrence Berkeley has a reasonably big project in which is jointly funded by the DOE and the EPA to try to understand that risk. Um, they're doing a combination of laboratory work and simulation to try to figure out that. Uh, we're studying that ourselves from a different perspective, which is to try to figure out at which point would you care about it. If a little bit of CO2 comes out, 
and it makes a very small amount of source code, and it's not a big deal, you have to pay it. At what point do you actually get worried? Excuse me. At what point do you really, are you concerned about the fact that you've degraded a wireless device? And so we're trying to take it from the opposite perspective. So uh, as opposed to the sort of the basis up, you know, what are the reactions that happen? We're still saying we're coming from the other way. You know, at what point do you care? And uh, EPRI is also putting some money into this, trying to figure this out because it's an important question. Um, again, the, mostly what this boils down to is the wells. Because it's the only way, it's, it's the primary way to get a lot of CO2 back to the surface. Mm -hmm. CO2 pipelines have a pretty good track record. The way that, th there's a paper that written in 2006 by Sally Benson and uh, now she's at Stanford, in which she compared the operational risks and the sort of environmental hazards from conventional oil and gas analogs, natural gas storage and so on. And those risks are quantified there. And the punchline from her paper was, Carbon capture and sequestration risks are not going to be bigger than that. So if you were to, say, duplicate the entire infrastructure of the oil and gas industry to handle CO2, that would effectively be potentially doubling that total risk. Because CO2 is not flammable, it has low reactivity in general, um, one could make a case that the risks would be less than that, but we haven't made that case convincingly yet. Uh, all right, um, the questions are coming in on the web. I've still got, uh, I just got two more. I'm going to try to get to the last one that I had here first and then get to somebody in the audience again. Oh, atmospheric release. But I, ta I talked about that. Um, just th one last point on that. We understand something about the transmission loops along faults. And one of the things we know is that they're three or four orders of magnitude less than the transmission loads on wells. So again, wells are the standout risk in that regard. A uh, question from Merad uh, Lord Jui, I think. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation. One thing that bothers me about sequestration itself is that if I use the figures from Kamen, a data remember, presented yesterday, your price figures represent about 200 billion barrels of oil equivalents uh, to estimate the cost. This gets into a question which you asked actually about the energy prices. Um, the primary costs that I talked about are costs in energy because it takes energy to reconstitute the resorbent or to run an air separation unit or something like that. Again, rounding numbers when you aggregate all the technologies, you look at them large. What you're talking about is something like a 30% energy penalty, which means if you try to post-combustion retrofit you on a power plant, you derate your power plant something like 25%. You turn a 1,000 megawatt power plant into a 750 megawatt power plant. Uh, you can do it. From an engineering perspective, it's not necessarily the best way to do it. Uh, if you, uh, that's particularly true for IGCC plants. And that's an important point because IGCC plants, the whole I is for integrating. If you build an IGCC plant and it's configured a certain way and everything's integrated, and then you try a retrofit, all of your components are missized. And so people have talked about making plant sequestration ready. Uh, Dave Hawkins from NRDC says, you know, my driveway is Ferrari ready. You know, it's, it's you know, you know, you should be thinking instead about sort of an integrated design if you can. It's easier to think about it in new plants. Um, I don't think, and, and this, I want to I want to make a, a point about this because this is at the end of this note. It says, isn't this a huge amount to make the miracle you mentioned at the beginning of the seminar by investing the development of renewable and clean technology? Um, first of all, no. I don't think it's a lot to invest. We have a tremendous challenge in front of us, and we're going to have to fire on all pistons right from the very beginning or else we're just not going to make it. I wake up in the mornings, I have good days and bad days. Some days I'm like, Hosanna, we're, we're going to make it. We're going to get there. We're going to finally realize that we need to do this. The other is I just wake up and go, no, we're not going to make it. Uh, but, but it's uh, a question of that. But, but the main thing that I want to dispel is the notion that there's somehow a trade-off between investing in sequestration versus other green technologies. I mean, first of all, that's preposterous on its face. I'm looking at California, which put a million solar panels on roofs because you know, uh, the Public Utilities Commission is proposing a $600 million research program. Uh, all of which is aimed at renewables. To think that somehow that's going to take money away from sequestration or the other way around is sort of not real. There's, I mean, the sequestration research budget for the federal government is $112 million. The EERE, Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy Budget, is about $1.6 billion. So, you know, you, you know, you pay your money as you take your chances, but I don't look at this as a zero-sum game. I look at this as we all have to work really hard to get there. Um, but the other thing is it really is going to be a question of how costs run into the marketplace. Um, and in there, it's a question of a levelized playing field. I think that there's terrifically good reasons 
to incentivize renewable power supply and to incentivize energy efficiency. And the reason why is because they're worth doing. We're going to get carbon abatement. We're going to save money. We're going to do all these things. But we have a potential energy well. We have a hump to get over, and we should do that. But there's public good in that. There's public good in spending more money for your power from solar power because it's going to help build a new industry, and we're never going to get there if we don't try. Sequestration is sort of in the same basket at this point. There's public good in figuring out if this is going to work or not, especially in the state of California, where we have such a dramatic need to reduce emissions in the near term. And so I very much think that this is money well spent. The last point about it is where the resources are. Um, one of the things that I came to understand very, very clearly in the past couple of years is that we don't set policy in China. We don't. China's sitting on the world's third largest coal reserves. They put in 100 gigawatts, 100,000 megawatts of power last year, and they're going to put in more this year. I don't think we're going to get substantial carbon reductions in certain places in the world without carbon capture and sequestration. But the other thing is just the question of the distribution of resources. It's hard for us to set policy in Wyoming, much less China. The Powder River Basin sits on top of 600 million, sorry, 600 billion tons of coal. That coal is sent to Florida for combustion. And the reason why is because half of our power comes from coal. It's still going to be a cheap, available resource. We're not going to use oil to do this separation, like you say. We're going to use more power from coal. And these things have been calculated in the form of uh, effective abatement. If you look again at the IPCC documents, the older literature, they talk about the fact that you have this energy penalty. There's extra CO2 that comes from that. So when you actually make the calculation, you have to put that all together and roll it up. And the numbers which I gave you for, are for that. So that's the, sort of the final point from there. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask if you felt like California is a is ready to have a good world scale uh, uh, CCS uh, storage project. Mm -hmm. uh, the best answer that I can give you for that is there's no technical reason why not. <laughs> Whether or not it's ready is going to be a question that California is going to answer itself. Um, and you get competing voices. Uh, you have voices uh, from laboratories, from universities, from VC companies, from the commission from different places that are saying different things. Um, you have environmental groups that are gung-ho for it, for it. You have environmental justice groups that are dead set against it. Welcome to California. Um, I think what I believe is going to be the case is that we're, we need a project to figure out whether or not this is going to work for the state. And that we pretty much need to start that right away because if we figure out in 2015 that we need a whole lot more abatement than we are at, we're not going to be able to spin that up in a year. We're going to really need to put our ducks in a row now to see whether or not this is a viable option for the state. Okay, a uh, question from Bruce, Bruce McLaughlin. I just heard that DOE is pulled out of the future Gen Queen coal plant in Illinois. Any comment on this? Uh, absolutely not. What I do know is that uh, uh, Secretary Bodden spoke to the Illinois delegation yesterday. He hasn't actually pulled out of it. He said we're strongly considering pulling out of it. You know, it's typical the way things happen. The primary objection that was put on the table to this project as is was the cost. Like the cost for everything in the world, the costs of materials and labor have gone up. The original project was blocked at a billion dollars. It's now slated, depending on who you talk to, between 1.8 and 2.1 billion dollars. This gets back again to the issues of cost. That's true for everything. That's true for nuclear. That's true for wind turbines. That's true for pipelines. That's true for everything. Some sectors are hit bigger than others, but all of the costs have gone up. Um, we're going to see where that finally ends up. Uh, what I do believe, and we've been working with a number of companies that are going to do this in a number of states, Illinois and Texas, before the decision was made, said, we're going to do this on our own if we're not selected. So I expect that they're probably going to do something like that on their own. There are projects that look like this that have been proposed in Wyoming, in Colorado, and in California with BP's Carson project. And we'll see if we get there. Uh, but we do know that Australia's zero gen project is online to start in 2010. This is a place, again, where we're sacrificing American leadership. And personally, I would like to see, if not future gen, a project like future gen come forward very, very, very quickly. Before I forget, that reminded me of something. Uh, for those of you who just can't get enough about sequestration, uh, Next Wednesday at the Sheraton Hotel, 
Natural Resources Defense Council and Environmental Defense are co-sponsoring a day-long session on the topic. And they're bringing in people from all over the country. A number of the names that I mentioned, Sally Benson, Howard Herzog, are going to be there, Gardner Hill from BP. Um, they're actually, I said Sacramento on the 13th. It's at the, at the Sheridan starting at 8.30. It's in Los Angeles on the 14th at USC. And so we're doing a traveling road show. And uh, I'm going to be a part of that as well, so if you didn't get to pepper me with questions now, you can do that there. But uh, I, in part, I wanted to mention that because the ARB is actually a co-sponsor of that effort. And, uh, and so is the California Energy Commission, CPUC, a number of entities in California are co-sponsoring that effort. Okay. Another one in the room. Okay, let's take this one in right here. Could you please share your thoughts on biological sequestration? My thoughts about biological sequestration, and by that I believe you mean terrestrial sequestration, storing CO2 either in the terrestrial biosphere or in soils, is something that we need to look at carefully. Um, there is a lot of science that's not settled on that. Um, as I was saying over lunch, um, every month or so, there's going to be a paper in Science or Nature that says it's much better than we thought it was. And there's another paper that says it's much worse than we thought it was. And the reason why is because it's, it's a complex feedback system. It's a complex cybernetic system. It has all, many, many moving parts, many of which we haven't mapped particularly well. Um, but I, I, my, the hope of biological sequestration is that it can actually do a lot. And if you look at some of the estimates that have come forward for how much CO2 could be stored in the terrestrial biosphere and soils, you can get quite a lot, 80 to 100 gigatons in soils, you know, possibly two or five times that uh, compared to uh, the, the soils in the terrestrial biosphere. Those, you know, those are not numbers you just walk away from. So I think there's something to be done there. Um, I think if I were king, I would put a $100 million research program on that tomorrow and say, let's figure this out and see if we can do it. Because if we're going to count on that option, we need to figure that stuff out. But it's an important one. Let's go after it. Uh, one of the things, though, that, that sort of troubles me in the back of my brain, uh, Wolfgang, is about the accounting of that. Because that's sort of the, the devil is in the details in biological sequestration around the accounting. And uh, one of the things we're seeing is that people are purchasing offsets using biological sequestration. And people talk about, well, how do you know CO2 will stay underground in this geological response space for hundreds of years? Well, the accounting for that's a whole lot easier than a forest that, that has many, many moving parts and parts of it burned down and some of it goes into the soils and you've got different species and stuff. I don't say that to belittle biological sequestration because I really do believe it's important. But I think that those accounting issues are going to come back and bite us at some point if we're not careful about how we walk into this as an offset option. And I think I've got one more. What is the status of CCS projects in California? Um, there, the main project that hit the boards, of course, was the BP Carson project. And BP made an announcement and said, we're going to build a 500 megawatt hydrogen power plant. We're going to gasify pet coke. We're going to put the CO2 underground someplace. We haven't figured out yet, but we're going to do this. Edison Mission has bought on. A number of other partners have bought on. That project was to come online in 2013. It looks like it's been pushed back a little bit. They've decided for a number of reasons that they're saying we're not going to be as aggressive about this as we initially are. We're going to be a little more circumspect and make sure that we get buy-in from all the communities that we need to to make this happen. It comes back to, is California ready for it? Well, if Cal even if California is, apparently the greater Los Angeles area isn't quite. And so uh, they're learning about this and they're working with everybody to try to get that going forward. By any measure, that's the biggest option on the table. There's a, a pilot project uh, that's being pursued right now. It's a small project, a couple of thousand tons that West Carb is running. And that's being co-sponsored by the California Energy Commission at the Thornton site, so the town of Thornton, Thornton uh, gas field. Uh, that one is in the final permitting stages. Hopefully, they'll get over the last hump and start doing stuff soon. The alternate for that site is in Kimberlina, California, which is where Clean Energy Systems has its pilot plant. Um, that would also be sort of a couple thousand tons, uh, fairly small injection, but another place where we could potentially go forward. Also on the table, West Carb is proposing a fairly large project, a million tons a year or so, uh, looking at a zero emission gas plant. And uh, the status of that is in flux. I can't talk a lot more about it, but that's one that's being proposed. I know that there are other groups that are considering looking at these pure CO2 streams from refineries to methanol plants and thinking about those. I don't think those projects are very well formed, but interested parties and real parties are coming forward and trying to get into that. So in general speaking, I'm actually pretty optimistic. Um, California is not homogeneous. It's not homogeneous geologically. It's not homogeneous economically. It's not homogeneous philosophically. You know, Ronald Reagan and Nancy Pelosi come from the same state. You know, it's pretty different. 
you know, and and uh, there are going to be parts of the state that are going to be really interested in this technology. There are going to be other parts of the state that are not interested in this technology. There are going to be some parts of the state that say we love carbon capture and sequestration as long as it happens in Wyoming, you know. And, and we're going to see all these things play out in real time. Personally, I'm pretty optimistic. And I think the reason why is because as people learn more about the urgency of the climate crisis, the more they begin to understand what's at stake in the fossil fuel infrastructure and understanding that that's an important piece of the decarbonization to face head on and say, yeah, we're going to go after it. And we're going to go after conservation. And we're going to go after efficiency improvement. And we're going to go after renewables. But we're going to go after nuclear, too. And we're going to go after carbon capture and sequestration, too. And the reason why is because if we don't, it's going to be a lot more expensive and a lot more painful. The last figure I'm going to leave you with, and I'm going to sign off here because i got to run, um, came out of the Stern Report. If you guys remember in the U.K. last year, Nicholas Stern, a celebrated economist, led a study to try to figure out what the cost of global carbon abatement were. He said, if you roll that all up, it's 1% of global GDP. Buried in there, they referenced a paper that was done by the Pacific Northwest National Lab. It was a good paper. What they said is, what's the cost of doing that if you don't have carbon capture and sequestration as an option? If you just went with renewables, nuclear conservation efficiency, you went with all this stuff, but you didn't have carbon capture and sequestration, what would it look like? And basically, the costs of getting greenhouse gas abatement on a global scale go up 50 to 80 percent if you don't have carbon capture and sequestration. And it's not perfect everywhere, but there's parts of the economy where you just want that option. And I personally believe that California has some stake in this, and I would like to see that that option be vetted and considered seriously in thinking about how we are going to meet the challenges of these dramatic emissions reductions we're facing. Thank you very much.